Okay, um, good morning, academic English seniors. This is my first time using Screencastify. I know, I'm crawling out of the dark ages here. Uh, so if it's a little strange, I apologize, but this is a, a first for me, so uh, just bear with me. So I created a presentation over the restoration. I actually had to go ahead and create it last night because I haven't taught the restoration in many years. <laughs> so um, I'm excited to be able to teach this, even if it means that we lose our time with Shakespeare, which I'm sure most of you are not super brokenhearted about. So we have here the Restoration, which went from 1660 to 1800. It is the time period that immediately follows the Renaissance. Then we have Elizabeth here, Queen Elizabeth I. She is the Virgin Queen. Um, if you remember, she was the one of the last monarchs of the Renaissance time period, and, and really the, the last great monarch of the Renaissance time period. Um, she was an inspirational leader. She helped reestablish the Church of England, which was a Protestant religion. And that was important because if, you, if you've, you know, kind of been remembering and following along as we've talked over the last semester and a half, throughout British history, religion has played a really important role in politics, in government, and in the literature. And that was especially true during the Renaissance. We saw with Paradise Lost being a religious undertone, um, Dante's Inferno having a religious undertone, Dr. Faustus having a religious undertone. It was really pretty prevalent. And even in King Arthur, they they had the... Uh, um, Pentecost being the feast day that everybody paid most attention to. Okay, so I know that the recording is pretty much seamless, but I apologize if I go in and out of presentation mode. It's because one of my children came in to ask me a question. All right, so moving on past the religious connotation, um, she was never married and as a result had no heir to the throne, which was politically significant. And she was widely written about and idealized by many of the writers during that time period. One of the stories we didn't get to read that we were going to read, um, The Fairy Queen, is actually written about Queen Elizabeth. So there is that. All right. Um, James I was the king who ruled after Elizabeth. His reign went from 1603 to 1625, and he actually ruled over both Scotland and England simultaneously. He was one of the first to do that. He bridged the gap because he was a member of both the English uh, royal family and the Scottish royal family. You may be familiar with Guy Fox and the gunpowder plot. That was a pretty famous moment in history where um, again, religiously, there was a conflict um, between Catholics and Protestants, and Guy Fox was attempting to kill James I and his family and sort of reestablish the, the religious um, perspective of the, of the kingdom. And then there was a comment that I laughed about when I was researching James the first. It said that Elizabeth was king. Now James is queen. There was some question as to the sexuality of James the first. His king, his reign was also um, fraught with financial troubles. He was a terrible financial advisor and he took the advice of all sorts of people that led him down the wrong path. And so England was really in a lot of financial difficulty during his reign and right after. Then he was replaced by Charles I, who was James's son. His reign went from 1625 to 1649, and he ruled England, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, so if you have studied England's history much at all, you know that they were a lot like, um, oh, I'm going to forget his name. Oh, oh, well, a lot like Rome, anyway, from the past, when they would try to conquer other countries and take control of them. <clears throat> that was very much what was going on in England at the time. They were colonizing other countries and then taking them as their own. There was a lot of political and religious turmoil during his reign. He was himself an Anglican, which is based on the Church of England, but he was married to a Catholic, 
and he spent all of his time fighting against the Puritans. Those are all three different religious groups during this time period, and they were all constantly in conflict. Um, so, uh, and, and that plays an interesting part for us as Americans, because this is very much the time frame in which the Puritans became completely fed up with how things were going in England and decided to defect to the Americas. He was eventually defeated by Oliver Cromwell. This was the one point in English history where they were not a monarchy. Oliver Cromwell defeated J uh, Charles I and beheaded him in 1649, thus establishing the Commonwealth of England. The Commonwealth of England ruled from 1649 to 1660, and this is actually the end of the Renaissance, but it's so meaningful to the literature of the Restoration that I felt it was important to mention this. That Commonwealth included England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, so as you can see, they're very connected through much of history. And Oliver Cromwell became the Lord Protectorate. That was his title. So they went from a monarchy to a protectorate. Now, the protectorate is described as a republic. There was some elements of the people getting to choose what their government was doing and being able to have representation. They created the first instrument of government, they called it. It was essentially a constitution. So we were definitely not the first country to establish the concept of constitution. England had done it before us. But as you can see, they had two components that I thought was really interesting. They had an army council, and most of their political leaders were major generals. Those are both very militaristic terms. And so when Oliver died in 1658, his son Richard Cromwell took over. And you can see his reign here is very brief. And that's because he was not a military leader. He never fought in a military so the army council and the major generals started trying to take over instead of allowing Richard to be in control, and that just fell apart. And after that, the Commonwealth of England completely disintegrated, and that was when the restoration of Charles II took place. And that is really why this time period is known as the Restoration, because Charles II was restored to the throne. His reign was from 1660 to 1685, and he was reinstated as monarch after the Commonwealth fell apart. Then they had something called the Clarendon Code, uh, which was ironically named after a man who didn't really buy into everything the Clarendon Code stood for. But essentially what it was was no separation of church and state. The state got to dictate exactly what you believed, what you could what religion you could practice and people who practiced a different religion than what the state dictated were completely ostracized. Some of them were exiled and excommunicated from England itself. Like they weren't even allowed to live there. They weren't allowed to hold public positions. Uh, people weren't allowed to practice their faiths outside of. Okay. Um, where did I leave off? Oh, people were not allowed to practice any faith outside of the one that the church established, which was Anglican, the Church of England. Uh, despite all of that religious turmoil that was going on, he was known as the Merry Monarch. He was well liked by the people and a little bit of a of a party animal, kind of. Definitely went for the parties, the dances, the drinking, the having a good time. And that really freaked the Puritans out, which probably helped to establish the idea, well, they're not going to let us practice our faith. And they are, the king himself is encouraging behaviors that we don't believe in. So I'm sure a lot of that contributed then to the Puritans wanting to move on to a new country. Okay, so they have a long line of monarchs. And I'm not going to talk in depth about each of them, but I did want you to kind of know what was going on politically because so much matters to the context of what we're reading. During this time period, these are all of the monarchs that, that reigned during what is known as the Restoration. We have James II, who was overthrown after only three years because of religious struggles. It was known as the Glorious Revolution, and it was glorious because it was without bloodshed. He was killed and thrown, no, sorry. He was not killed, no bloodshed. He was overthrown um, 
because his he was Catholic. And so for a brief time, he tried to reinstate Catholicism in England. And the people were like, no, 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 no. We don't want anything to do with that. So they overthrew him and brought in Mary II and William III. They actually reigned together. It was a husband and wife. Mary was actually the queen, um, but William as her husband was king. And they ruled very um, companionably. They got along really well. She did contract smallpox and then uh, died as a result of smallpox, but she was the monarch in charge when England adopted its first Bill of Rights, and she died without an heir. Then her husband, William, ruled alone after her death, but there was a lot of division between the Whigs and the Tories. This was the first time that there was really like a two-party system, kind of like we have Republicans and Democrats, and so we had the Whigs and the Tories really kind of vying for power. He also died without an heir, obviously, and he never remarried after Mary. So then Mary's sister, Anne, was a monarch next, and she was the monarch in charge when Great Britain became a thing, which is actually England and Scotland combined. So they were no longer England. They were Great Britain. That was the first time that was a thing. She also died without an heir, not for lack of trying. She was pregnant 17 times, and none of them resulted in a child that outlived her. So that it, I'm sure that was really difficult for her to deal with. Then George I came in. George I and George II are actually German. Uh, they must have been tied through marriage and blood to the English throne. And so George I actually became what we know as a figurehead. Like Queen Elizabeth today is really not in charge of England. She's just a figurehead. So was George I. And that was the first time they really had a prime minister, someone who was in charge of the country that the people selected as opposed to divine right of kingship. George II then was his, actually, yeah, his son. And he was really actually German. George I went to Germany but was English. George II was actually from Germany. That's where he was born. And he was the last British monarch to lead an army into battle because after that, really, like I said, all of the monarchs after that were just figureheads. They were not actual leaders or rulers. And history did not remember him kindly. So we kind of fall out of the restoration on an interesting note. All right, this slide is not got a lot of content on it, but it is super, super important satire. Everything about this time period is written with dripping satire, sarcasm just loaded. Um, and as a definition, I said it's a literary term you should already know the definition of. So if you don't remember satire, we're going to come back to that on another slide. But there is a document that you can view that I've attached to this presentation. Okay, Com potential comparison points. This is a slide we will come back to later so that we can do these comparisons between then and now. But here were some of the major things that were happening. Resurgence of the plague. So in the Renaissance during the 1300s, that was when the Black Plague was really most prevalent. But now in the 1600s, there was a resurgence of that plague. The Great Fire of London actually started as a result of a fire in a bakery. And because London was so dry, they were in the midst of a drought. A lot of the town burned. Um, luckily, not a, a lot of people were killed, but there was massive damage to the town. This is also the time period that sparked off the Industrial Revolution. And you'd think that that would make life better for a lot of people, but the reality was it created a lot of poor living conditions and a lot of poor working conditions. And there was a huge disparity between the rich and the poor. The rich were really rich. And there was this massive contingency of poor people who were really poor. Political cartoons were huge. They started during this time period. And again, going back to that satire and that sarcasm, sarcasm and, and how politics was kind of a joke in, in a lot of ways. There you see my link next to number seven, satirical writing styles. 
those were really popular during this time period. And so please view that slides presentation if you need a refresher. That is the slides presentation where we watched a bunch of videos that explained what satire is. I encourage you to go back and look at that if you need to, to help you remember what satire is, because that is our major focus during this time period. Okay, we have several religions in this time period that were common. Ooh, I left one off the slide. Shoot. Um, I'll just mention it, but I, I'll, I'll add it in later. So we have Catholicism. Actually, you know what? I think I can pause and add it in now. All right. I went ahead and fixed that slide. Okay. So these are all the religion, the major religions of the time period. First of all, we have Catholicism, which was widely persecuted against and ostracized, which is really interesting because um, I think today people consider Catholicism to be one of the major religions in the world. And it is, it has a, ma a, a massive following. But at the time in England, especially, it was very, it was, it was wrong to be Catholic. Puritans were also persecuted and ostracized. And Christian Protestants were actually also a bit restricted. The only people that were really flourishing during this time period were the Anglicans. And if you remember, that was based on the Church of England that actually Henry VIII started just so that he could get a divorce from his first wife. Um, so there was a lot of religious persecution going on during this time period. And if you didn't follow those rules, if you remember, um, what was that? What was that phrase that they called that? The Clarendon Code. If you did not follow the rules of the Clarendon Code, then you could get into a lot of trouble for practicing a religion you weren't allowed to practice. All right, then we have deism. That is a whole new belief system generated during this time period. And I have the definition there. It's a system based on reason and the observation of nature and a belief in a creator who set the universe in motion and then left it to its own devices. Two famous deists were Newton and Locke. Locke will will be studying. He's one of our authors. But Newton, you know, as the, the guy who kind of discovered the concept of gravity, the apple falling from the tree bit. Um, so even as a scientist, he believed in this concept that there was a, a higher being that created the universe, but wasn't controlling it, created it and left it to run as it was meant to do very much like we might today create a machine and then leave it to do its own thing, not control it, not, not, uh, uh, step in at every moment. Um, so that was an interesting creation. And, and the religious persecution in this time period is very important as well to uh, our, our literature. Okay. There is one story in the midst of all of that reading that I asked you to also read. It's called One Dead in Attic. And we'll be discussing that at a later date, date in the form of a compare and contrast between some literature from the restoration and some situations happening now. So for now, I would just like you to read that story. We're not going to discuss it fully. Last slide. So the last two pages you were supposed to read were about what a novel is. And the word novel actually means new, something that is new, never done before. So the question posed to you was what is new about a novel? And those three things I have listed there are what is new about a novel that hadn't really ever been done in literature before. If you look back at everything you read, everything was really in what is known as the epic poetry style. Everything you read was written in verse. It was not written in prose, which is what a novel is. So first of all, the sense of realism. The protagonist was meant to be someone you could relate to, not superhuman, not godlike, not a superhero, but just your everyday Joe, someone you could think, well, that could have been me or, or I could have been in that situation. We accompany him through travels and are drawn to root for them. Like, we want them to win. And there were a lot of critics who were concerned with that because some of the main characters in novels of this time period were doing what might be considered some questionable things, probably religiously questionable. And so their concern was, if we are rooting for them, if we want them to win, what is that doing to our own moral guide, our own moral compass? So there was some concern there. And then it showed a desire for intimate details. We wanted to know the characters' motivations, their hopes, their fears, what drove them, what 
what made them who they are. And that was something that really hadn't been done before either. If you think back on all the characters we've read, we've learned very little about them. We follow on their adventures, but we don't know much about the characters. So the novel was the first time that the character really became prominent and understanding the character and his or her development became so important. So our characters will become much more important now than they ever used to be in the in the previous British literature we've studied. So if you don't have some of this information in your notes, I highly encourage you to include it in your notes. But be sure to take your own notes and send me a picture of those notes as was requested from yesterday's homework before you include these notes. I really just want you to have read the text first on your own, gotten what you can from it, and then add to it from my notes. Um, and then we will go from there. So hopefully this uh, worked out good and um, I'll be posting it shortly.